So, okay, welcome to then our last presentation, Becoming an uh, Open Foreign Language Educator. Um, and today we're going to be talking about professional development. Um, and let's see. the place that I, I uh, want to start is a website that we've been working on um, that uh, I, I think what's it is the idea is, is just as I was prompting the, the panelists to share their stories, and again the stories are very particular. Um, they're anchored in a particular locale. Uh, they come from different languages. But here is a website that we're putting together. We have put together, but it's actually always going to be in a state of becoming because we it is an open website and we're soliciting from you right here, and from those of uh, uh, you joining us on the internet. You too can write your story about becoming an open language educator. Um, let me just highlight a couple of these people. You already know them. Uh, so if we go up to the top there, um, we see that the people from KU, from Kansas University, who've been talking to us, share their uh, story about how they created Excesso, the, the ups and the downs. And we also have a member of their team who hasn't been present here, but was an integral part of their developmental team Kia. Um, so you can see that they're just about uh, two or three paragraphs, not or three or four paragraphs, not not that long. Um, so you've heard about Excesso. Let me just show you a couple of the other people. Um, Wen Watang is a Chinese lecturer, and she talks about herself as not a very technological person, not particularly technically savvy. So I think that's an important story. How she started to do. She's put together a wealth of materials, and again, she continues to see herself as not particularly good at technology. That's a voice I really wanted a lot of people to hear, because I hear that again and again. She's overcome a lot of, not only her fears of technology, but she's found ways to collaborate with people who then are better at technology than she thinks she is. Um, uh, let's go back. And uh, of course, you've met George Detivo. One of the things that George talked about yesterday, and he highlights in his story, is uh, using OER has put him in touch with a community of practitioners. So that was the thing that he kept talking about yesterday. He, he articulates that nicely in, the, in his story, among other things. I, that's one of the things I took away from his story. Um, uh, we mentioned, let's see, the Spanish in Texas project. I just saw that the, the, both the directors are here today in the back, Jacqueline and uh, Barbara. Um, it's a highly collaborative endeavor on many different levels, and they keep expanding the collaborative team. And they talk about how they're using their students in, in their research, both undergraduate and graduate. And now they're reaching out as, as researchers, as sociolinguists reaching out to applied linguists reaching out to, te to language teachers. So they're kind of layers of, of collaboration in that particular story. Um, we have um, Nicola is an interesting um, story there. Nicola is somebody who used, the, um, like Daniel, like Daniel Heron. She stumbled across uh, Orlando's materials and was using Tafalado. And she, she was a, a learner of, of Portuguese, and she, but, but her background is in t uh, ESL teaching uh, English as a second language. So she was already a teacher, and she had already made pedagogical materials. And something about Orlando's materials really excited her, because they were open. This was new to her. So as a student learning Portuguese, she had all these ideas learning through Tapalado. And she thought, hmm, I wonder if I can write uh, kind of extensions to his materials as a student, writing materials for other students. And this is a kind of an interesting story that happens again and again. People who are like Daniel, who are students themselves, have great ideas for other students. And it kind of, so it's the, the role of a student becoming, stepping into the, the teacher's role. Um, uh, Tola Mosadam Domi is, of course, the, the Yoruba instructor who wrote an a open language textbook with us. And she talks about kind of the notion of in reach, how she sent it out to the community, and then her students created these YouTube videos, and it keeps going. Um, let's see if anybody up. Uh, you know, there's Orlando, and, um, and he's created a ton of materials online. And he 
talks about several of his projects here. Um, I wanted to, uh, Laura Franklin, we mentioned her name. She is the, the editor of World Languages at Merlot, which is now you know a large archive. She talks about the vetting process. We, we discussed yesterday how OERs, there are still questions about their quality. Um, they're trying to address that issue of quality control at Merlot, and she actually asks you to join her because, of course, is this crowdsourced notion. You're foreign language teachers, you can then write evaluations and join their editorial team. Tony uh, is, of course, our the new president of ACTFL. She's also the 2009 uh, French teacher or a foreign language teacher of the year, and she is a heavy user of Casse Interactive, and she talks about how she uses OERs in the classroom. And one interesting thing for, for, for teachers out there, um, talk about, she mentions the parents. So parents like OERs because it brings it into their class. They can engage, they can help their, they can learn along with their students, their, 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 their children. Um, and then finally we end up with, um, we're, we, we're, we're, we have more people that we want to add to this, but we have these two who, uh, two people at the bottom who are both from the UK, affiliated with the Open University. So here, Fernando talks about using iTunes as a platform. There's a ton of materials on iTunes. And Tita talks about an interesting research kind of pedagogical project. She calls, she talks about it as research scholarship. Our, um, our scholarship projects, and she's talking about performance, foreign language performance. Uh, uh, this is through the European Union, so there are many different languages, and they are basically using drama in the classroom. So this is uh, a really interesting project that's also, all of these are, are open, all of these are, are people's stories. So you can join us, and you can help us amplify, keep growing this uh, uh, this website. We will also be publishing this as a booklet and uh, disseminating this at conferences. The point here is this: this is um, on a spectrum. There are people who have been in kind of the OER, the Open Education Movement, for several years, and then there are other people who are absolute beginners, people who have just tried their hand at it, and they talk about. That. So it doesn't. You don't have to have expertise. You just have to have um, a little bit of hooks, but I can say I can do this, and then uh, send in your story. Okay. So um, that's one thing that we are building, and that we we've been working hard out on uh, for this this uh, symposium. Um, the next thing I, I want to talk to you about a little bit about is the whole notion of professional development, and that includes all of us, but uh, particularly the, the idea of teacher education. And I think there are a couple of problems here, and those problems have been confirmed uh, with my discussions with some teachers uh, during the symposium. Uh, teacher education, we conceptualize professional development uh, kind of as teacher education as you are Rachel in the back said, you know, she's a brand new teacher. I just got, I was just got, uh, finished my degree just out in the field. So she's gone through teacher education here at the University of Texas. Colleges get you a degree, right? Whether it's foreign language education or a foreign, uh, a degree in Spanish or whatever. And then we have this construct, we think about continuing education. Once you're out in the field, you do in-service workshops like this. And then typically you have another institution here in Texas, it's called TEA, Texas Education Agency. And they give you, they grant you credits, these continuing credits. You have to amass, how many do you have to amass every year? Or don't you have to, uh, I can't remember. It's hours. Not hours, credits, right. And okay, and it's given in hours, right? So seat time. 60 something. Yeah. 60 something. 60 something, 60 something hours annually, okay? Okay, but I think that there are some big problems with the way we conceptualize then professional development uh, and those two bullet points, teacher education and continuing ed. First of all, we've been talking the uh, past couple of days about informal learning because there's a lot of learning that happens informally. Um, so lifelong learning, and so basically it grants you knowledge, but it doesn't give you these degrees, it doesn't give you hours, it doesn't come packaged in the way that the institutions talk about them. Um, and informal learning now has moved largely online. People are learning in 
incredible amount of material because they now have access to all kinds of scholarly articles. Um, you know, we now have MIT, that, uh, MIT courseware, all of the materials that never uh, existed before, all online. So we have learning networks, peer learning, all the kinds of things we've been talking about for the past day, day and a half. So the rise in informal learning, I would also say there's a kind of the underspecified, what I'm terming, underspecified college degree. Um, so what does your college degree really mean? What does it mean? Uh, it, it is important. You have to get a college degree to gain entrance into the <coughs> profession. Um, but it just, as I said here, it just represents, uh, it, it represents knowledge as an, abstra as an, a, an abstraction. Um, and as I said, it's far removed from actual learning. So if you have a degree in Spanish, does that mean you speak Spanish? No. I hope so. What level? But it doesn't really tell you at what level you speak Spanish. Um, people are often surprised that it is heavily kind of, uh, focused on literature, culture, different things. So from a point of view of an employer, the degree doesn't always tell you what you can do. right? Um, people with the same degree, this is a pretty obvious thing, students who graduate from the same program and who have the same degree do not have the same skill set. Uh, they may not have taken exactly the same courses either. So I think that there is a need for more granularity. From the point of view of the profession, uh, what does that mean? Granularity, specificity. What can you do with your degree? Um, there's another problem here when you get into a profession. It's not just foreign languages, it's any profession. You have a resume or a CV, right? Well, again, from the employer's point of view, how do I know this stuff if you're really telling the truth? Because who writes a CV? You do. Okay. And the problem is, as, as I said, it, it's hard to validate this information. Even when you have you know, these three or four people that you say um, can be your references, there's a lot of information on them. They're, they're basically character references. They don't know uh, whether you actually took this course and accomplished this goal. So they often, employers, for principles, let's say, can't verify your skills because they themselves don't have those skills. Right? Um, they lack the competence to see whether you can actually speak the foreign language. They're hiring you to teach, and so forth. So this is leading. So I do think there are big problems in professional development. And in that little promo that I showed you about open education, it starts with the problems, and then it leads to some of the solutions. So here are the problems with education, and open education can solve some of those problems. Well, part of open education the professional development side of open education is now being called badges. And I know, I know people think Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts when they use the word badges. That's okay, because that's exactly what, uh, where it came from. This I, little icon, which means that you have achieved something, that you have a particular skill or competence. Okay? Um, so badges are basically an alternative to the system that I've been describing, which has been driven by formal learning and institutions, and is more kind of this ground, this, this, this groundswell of open educators who are trying to uh, give people, uh, who are trying to recognize informal learning as an important part of professional development. And also credentialing, it makes it part of them your credentialing. So obviously, just like Girl Scout, Boy Scout badges, it's a visual representation. So icons, think of icons in the, uh, the internet uh, or the digital context. And this is important. It is being given to you by an agency, such as Coral, or a University of Texas, or you know, whatever. Um, and so we, are, we, we can grant badges. Um, and it's verifiable. I'm going to show you how an employer says, oh, really? And, but who is Coral? They can click on this and they can get all the information about who we are, uh, what we do. Um, it's also verifiable evidence of achievement. So you say that you have, um, you can use a particular authoring system to create an OER. Show me. Click on the link and it'll take you to essentially what is a professional portfolio. You're going to learn how create your portfolio, and then have evidence to show other people. So it's basically taking your resume and 
turbocharging it, right? Getting all kinds of things that you can show to people who will be interested, not only in future employers, but also your colleagues to show them what you have and what you can do. And finally, it has a very flexible level of granularity, so you can take a, a seminar on a general con, uh, construct of, let's say, proficiency, linguistic proficiency, what is that? All, and then you can even drill down farther to, we may give uh, 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 some, well, there are different kinds of proficiencies, but let's just say oral proficiency, right? Or um, interactional competence, or we can break that down into lots of different badges. Okay, so that's the basic idea of badges. And now I'm going to turn it over to Rachel, who will show you, this is not just coral, this is big. This is big money is behind this uh, endeavor. The Gates Foundation is pouring millions of dollars into this. Mozilla, a lot of, lot of uh, organizations, because actually it came out of the digital community. The digital community, if you have a degree in computer science, and you're trying, you're being a, a, graph, or a graphic artist, people who are hiring you, they're not all that impressed by your college degree. They're not impressed by how many hours of seat time an institution does. They want to know what you can do. Okay, so let me turn it over to Rachel who will tell you then about the infrastructure, the guts of the system and how we actually get out to make this work. Okay, so yeah, as Carl said, I'm gonna give you some examples of badges and, and kind of give you an explanation so you can have a more concrete understanding of what they are. Um, Digital badges are something that originated online. They've often been associated with gaming and social social gaming sites. Um, sometimes it's just for fun. Um, Foursquare, I don't know if some of you are familiar with this, but it's kind of a uh, social game that uh, where you take your phone and you check into places in the real world, and then that gives you some status in this virtual community. Um, so that's one, um, that's one company that started uh, doing badges pretty early. Uh, Khan Academy, are you familiar with Khan Academy? It's uh, one of the first uh, open education sites, really. I mean, that, one of the first sites that really took this idea of let's create this engaging instructional content and put it online and make it open for everyone. Um, they're, it's mostly focused on math and science. Um, there's um, hundreds, thousands probably of short instructional videos that are very, I think, very heavily used these days by uh, teachers in K-12 to, to teach just kind of basic math and science concepts. But they started uh, offering badges. Um, they have sort of the, a badge system, and this is something you'll hear about too, are these badge systems where it's not just one badge but it can be a series of badges, so you can level up uh, in the system. Um, you know, you can, you, as you grow, as you gain more skills and achievements, you know, your role can change. So uh, they have this kind of astronomical uh, series of badges, meteorites and moons, and, and, and that's their badge types, but then they have actual badges that, you know, there can be an unlimited number of badges. You can set up a badge for anything. Um, you know, they have badge for you know, uh, quickly and correctly answer five skill problems in a row. Um, picking up steam is the name of that badge. Making progress. Um, good habits. Thumbs up. So I mean, you can really make a badge on any level. And what's starting to happen now is. Um, now on Facebook, there's a, a little widget for the Khan Academy where your badges can also show up on your Facebook page. Okay, so that kind of, now we're getting towards something like open badges. Um, so the really exciting thing right now is that Mozilla is developing an infrastructure uh, technology, basically, that provides a way to share badges across all different websites and all different communities. So these badges can follow you uh, where you go. They, you, uh, they're stored in a central location, or the information about the badges is stored in a separate location, and then different websites can pull that information in. So I'm gonna give you just to kind of, well, I'm going to give you a little live demo of this, but first, um, this is the Mozilla site you can go to. It is in beta right now, so it's not completely 
launch yet, um, but you can already go there and you can uh, follow the instructions to become a badge earner. Uh, and what they have is this concept of a backpack. So you can get an account on this site where you can collect your badges. So when somebody awards you a badge, if Coral awards you a badge or your teacher awards you a badge, you can collect that badge and then store it in this backpack. And then that way it can be shared with other, with other websites. This kind of gives a, a visual of that. Um, the earner puts their badge in the backpack and then it can be shared out to be displayed maybe on a personal website, social networking, WordPress, job sites. Um, that's kind of the vision for the future is that you can have these badges um, really be part of your online persona. And this is just kind of the larger ecosystem. So the Mozilla enables um, badge issuers, which can be institutions, it could be individuals, it's really open. It's open to anybody can issue a badge for anything. There's no sort of requirements to becoming a badge issuer. Uh, anybody can create a badge. I mean, there's guidelines online, and I think this is going to become much easier as tools are being developed right now that will make it very easy for anybody to create their own badge um, and then award it to somebody who has uh, completed the material necessary to earn that badge. Um, so that shows kind of the, the, large, the larger picture there. And now I, I do want to just give you a quick, so you can see what this really looks like. So let's see, I've already uh, just to fill the, the space here as she's queuing things up. So badges, this idea has already been adopted by universities as um, kind of a supplement to the regular system of teaching a course and giving grades. Um, University of, of California Davis, for example, which is like an ag school. Again, they give courses, they have their courses, but in addition, they realize that there were competencies, actual skills that they wanted to document. And so they're doing it in addition. They're, at, they're issuing badges in addition to their grades and, and diplomas and so forth. So it's not either or, people, um, but lots of universities are picking this up, as well as school systems. So, okay. <clears throat> okay, so I've already actually set up a kind of a test account on here. So I've already set up a backpack. The first thing you would do if you click on this, visit your Mozilla Badge backpack, that'll get, take you through the sign-up process so you can create a backpack. Um, but then you can get started and actually earn your first badge. So it gives you a little bit of information, background about badges. You're, it's basically a little tutorial that you're taking here. Okay, and then you have to answer a few questions. So true or false, learning today happens everywhere, not just in classrooms. What do you think? True. That's right, okay, next. True or false, you can understand a person's skill set simply by looking at their degree. Oh. False, okay. True or false, resumes are validated and evidence-based. False, okay. Okay, so congratulations, you just earned the Badges 101 badge. <laughs> so, badge about that. Exactly, there's lots of badges about badges, actually, that's sort of the first. <laughs> Just to get Wait, you going. It yeah. gets harder. It gets harder. So, okay. So we're going to push this to my backpack. And it all works. Um, let's see. Gmail. It was asking for my email. 
you will be filling this out with your email, not with Coral's email. Right? <laughs> because you're going to be launching your own badges backpack. And so then you want to actually accept it uh, because somebody could award you a badge that you're not really interested in having. Um, so you, you get to choose whether or not you want to accept it. But if you want to accept it, you just say, okay. And then we can go to the backpack and take a look at, at how it looks. Okay. And I am already logged in here. So now once you've earned a badge, it shows up here. Um, and then there's this, you could just drag it into a group. So if I wanted to put, uh, you can name your group whatever. So if you have a group for language teaching badges, you could group those badges together. I mean, it's, you can curate, you can organize this how you like. Um, I'm, and then also just wanted to show you if you click on a badge. So a badge essentially is kind of two things. A badge is an image file, you know, just a plain old image file. But uh, embedded in that file is this metadata about what it means. Um, so the name of the badge, the URL of the issuer of the badge, um, the organization, um, the details, description, criteria. Um, so it links to exactly what you had to do to earn that badge. And then the really interesting thing is it, it's optional, but an issuer can also provide a link to that evidence that shows that you completed. So if it's a blog post or if it's a portfolio or if it's whatever it is that you produced in order to earn that badge, that can be linked from that badge, so somebody can see exactly, you know, what you did. Um, so that's the really cool thing, and that's sort of the that's where the technology comes in is baking. They call it baking the badge, where you take the image and you in, embed the, the metadata, and then it actually just works like any image file. Like somebody could actually send you an attachment of that image file. You can upload. Like if you look here, there's a there's an option to choose a file. That could be just an image file that you upload, and it goes into your backpack with all of that information in it. So, there you, any questions? Of, yes. Um, I was actually wondering, and I saw there was a button to click there to disown the badge. Uh -huh. I can imagine if you've got, let's say, 200 badges. Um, you want to highlight the ones that show your real professional development. You don't really want to tell people, hey, look, I understand badges after you've got maybe hundred right. of them. Exactly. Right. So there was a comment from the audience about the disown this badge. Uh, and it, it is very helpful because if at some point you don't really feel like advertising to the world that you you know you've moved beyond this badges 101 and, and you have a higher level of achievement, you might want to get rid of these ones that were, you know, your, your lower levels. It's, it's like a resume, too, because when you start out, your resume is going to change over time. It's your job to curate your own resume. Yeah. Oh. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'm talking to the yeah, mic, sorry, so I don't have to. Sorry. I keep forgetting uh, that we need a mic. So the comment is um, that it's your job to curate your own resume, badges that are going to be part of your, your CV. Yeah, and so as you become as the, your professional development changes over time, yeah, a lot of stuff you don't really want to highlight anymore. In fact, you might just want to get rid of them. Can you hide badges, Rachel? Can you hide badges? <coughs> I mean, if you have uh, some skill sets that have nothing to do with teaching Spanish. Yes, yeah. yeah uh, actually, and I'm trying to see, I think in the group, there's somewhere where you can set it to, to hide. OK, so. Yeah, I mean, you can, I know you can hide some of these groups. I'm not okay. saying immediately how to do it, but you can, you can choose which ones you want to share and which ones you want to hide. Yeah. So, again, if you're applying for jobs and you have three different employers, you can send, you can share different groups of badges to those employers. You don't have to share all of your backpacks, so that's something else. 
Okay, I want to show you another site that is making a lot of use of badges, these, these open badges for learning in particular, and that's P2PU, Peer-to-Peer -peer University. Whoops, that's not it. I think it's probably .org. Okay, on P2PU, uh, this is an open learning platform. Basically, anybody can create a course about any topic, and anybody can join that course. Um, and I just want to show you a few examples. They've arranged it. There's a, there's a couple of interesting communities here. There's the uh, School of Ed, they call it, which are all education-related courses. Um, and then there's also the School of Open, which focuses on open education. I know that there's a lot of material that's being developed right now uh, for the School of Open. That's going to be a growing, and they just launched it uh, very recently. But I just want to show you, and actually there, there's, there's different types of courses in P2PU. It's not all, some of them are courses that are led by an expert. Um, some of them are, are courses that are really that are led by an expert, and you sign up for it, and it has a start date and an end date, kind of a more traditional um, uh, path. And then there's what they call study groups, which is just somebody who wants to learn about something, and they invite people to join them, and they just work together as a study group. With that's usually a beginning and end time. And then they have this concept of challenges. So a challenge is something that they set up, somebody sets up a challenge uh, with a set of tasks and anybody can complete that challenge at any time um, and it just stays up there. Um, the ones I wanted to show are in the School of Ed, so let me see if I can get back to the home page. So this is, a, a, I believe, a study group that's going on right now. Um, this is kind of the general interface. You have tasks here uh, and then discussion going on at the bottom. Um, you can see the people that are involved in it, what type it is. It's a study group. Um, and then down at the bottom, I think, let's see. Somewhere you'll, you'll also see the badges that you can earn seeing that right now. But I did notice that for some of these uh, in the School of Ed, they, can, they will also offer a certificate of participation in addition to a badge. So an educator who needs to earn CPE credits um, could use this certificate, could, could get a certificate. Another example So I have links to them in my presentation, but you can poke around. The, the main thing that I wanted to, to show is just this interface. Um, and you can go in and check it out. And, uh, you know, it, it really, I like the way that they lay out the tasks and then they have the discussion around those tasks. And again, it is a lot, if it's a challenge, it'll have a number of hours associated with it too. And then you can, um, you can earn the badges. I'm not seeing one that has the badges. Here it says, you know, one. Uh, one badge is available. So yeah, this is okay. This is what I wanted to find is one that's really a challenge. So it says, you know, time it should take to complete two hours. You can start the challenge. You can always, anybody can take the challenge at any time. And then you can earn badges with the challenge. And those are open badges that can be displayed in your um, Mozilla backpack. Okay, so I'm going to skip through. 
these are some of the challenges that I wanted to show that I couldn't find all of them. There is a course on OER in the K-12 classroom that I thought some of you might be interested in. Um, and, you know, this is all coming. This hasn't really hit yet, but there was a, Lord, as Carl said, there's been um, grants given to a number of different projects, uh, ranging from K-12 to higher ed to continuing ed, a uh, huge range of projects that are all have, have all have gotten money to develop badge systems and to develop and share tools uh, that can be used to create badge systems. And those are all um, they'll be releasing those in 2013. I think there's going to be a whole slew of these systems around. So um, you know you'll be on the, the cutting edge there when you ha already have your backpack and are ready to go out and start earning. Okay. Yes. Now we're going to move on to our badges. So we, um, we've been, as I said, going around and uh, giving people the vision of open education. And, and a lot of people have told me the same thing. They're very excited about this. They don't know how to do it. So there's a gap between open education and all this goodwill, and there's a skill, skills gap and people want to implement it either in their classroom or they want to start adding on to OERs, but they're not quite sure how to do it. So we constitute right here, right today, um, a collaborative effort, um, a community of practice. And so we thought, well, the whole point of badges is to draw people in, in, into the community and help them start to fill that skills gap. Uh, so we're developing uh, from, based on this symposium to ex extend it, a couple of challenges. Rachel just told you about the idea of challenge, and for these challenges, you're going to receive badges. The badges will be in your backpack, because built into this will be part of, you, you'll get a badge for you know, developing the backpack. So um, our first badge is, of course, the power of openness attendee. Now, in the, for the continuing uh, education kind of notion of credits, uh, TEA gives you credits based on seat time. And we do that a lot of, uh, in education, hours, how many hours, this is a three hour course and so forth. That tells you very little about how much you learned, right? So I have people who come up to me uh, at conferences and you have to sign a piece of paper which says, I attended your talk. But I learned nothing, but I attended your talk, and so, right? So ours is not such a great measure of knowledge, and so what we're trying to do is promote the idea of badges. So yes, for attendee, well, it's more than just seat time. If you begin the challenge, and by the way, this now you're looking at the website that we've been developing, so we will give you the URL and you can just start. It's linked. It's, it's linked now. So here is the power. We can show this to you yesterday, right? This is the new, this is our grand finale, folks. So, we have, you, you've already registered, and remember we were telling you about all the materials, so all, all the PowerPoints, including this PowerPoint about badges, is all up there. And now we have this other link called Challenges. So you visit our site, you click on Challenges, and this is what you get. Getting started with open badges. The first thing we want you to do is read this really short article by Educause about seven things you should know about badges. It gives you an <coughs> overview about the concept because we went through it very quickly. Um, and then we're going to get you to sign up for your own badge, uh, open badge pack, backpack, uh, how to open up an account in Mozilla. That's really important because that's the whole infrastructure to do this. Uh, and then we, you're, you're going to take that little test. I think you're going to do fine, right? So <laughs> low anxiety to get your first ba uh, badge. As soon as you do that in Mozilla, you're going to do exactly what it says. It'll prompt you through your inter uh, your your Gmail account or your email account, and then you drag your Mozilla badge there. But not only that, we're, we're going to give you, if you do that successfully, we're going to give you a Coral Attendee badge. You didn't just sit here and you learn something and you can demonstrate it. So the point being, um, it's pretty easy to do that, right? The next step, reflect on the symposium. And you, okay, you've been here, you've been thinking about this. We, we asked you a couple questions. We want you to leave a reply for all the other people here, okay? 
And because this is a collaborative blog, you can comment on other people's posts. If you do that, we will give you a badge, okay? Pretty easy. But um, also informative because people have been thinking about things that they haven't said. Okay, and notice there's a deadline. Uh, the deadline is at the end of this month. So today is the 10th. You have a couple of weeks to do this. So that's all you need to do. Visit Mozilla website, open your back, your backpack, and then this blog is already set up. Leave a reply and you will get your badge. You're, you're on your way to being an open educator. That's the first step, the next, the next uh, challenge. The next challenge is a little bit more complicated. So we're calling you a, a collaborator badge. The whole point today has been talking about collaboration. We realize we uh, need you to join with us successfully. And to do that, click on the Begin Challenge. Uh, introduce yourself to uh, the group. You now constitute the group, including um, people on, online and, and, and our online community as well. So you introduce yourself to the group. Uh, and real quickly, a little paragraph. Uh, just who are you? You're, you're coming from different places, different languages, different levels, your, your institution, so forth. Next step, and that's by September 14th. So I'm giving you plenty of time. Next step, curriculum assessment. Um, we, we're, we're, just, we're assuming that you teach different languages and we want you to kind of think about your curriculum. By now, it'll, you'll be into classes will have started. You will have already started to think, hmm, that wasn't exactly what I thought it was going to be. I should have done something else. I should have done this differently. You will already be thinking about your curriculum. So we want you to do a short curriculum assessment. What areas, all, this is September and I can already tell I need to improve on things. What areas may need improvement in my current curriculum? Okay, so if you scroll down, uh, you'll see that we want you to post, these are essentially postings, we want you to post, again, one to two paragraphs about your curriculum. Where does it need improvement? Well, that leads you to the next step, which of course is searching for an OER that will help you improve your, your curriculum. And Rachel gave you uh, an overview of all the tools you can use, CC Search, uh, to help you find that perfect OER to fill the gap. Um, and you're going to, um, again, post your search. How was it? How was it for you? Uh, post your search by October 12th. Tell us uh, what tools worked for you in the search and what didn't work so well. Uh, how did you find your OER? And we're going to be learning from each other through this whole process, right? The next step is actually using that OER in the classroom. It does not have to be the big, we've been talking about big OERs. It can be a very little OER that focuses on one particular goal. Okay, so it doesn't, we're not talking about your entire curriculum. Think more in terms of a lesson, implementing something small. Uh, so I, I think it would work best to, to, as I said, focus on a couple of lessons, try it out, see how it goes with your students. Ask your students informally what do they think of it, and you uh, also um, <coughs> will, will tell us what you think of it. But that just we want you to tell us how you're implementing it for that that uh, step four. What are you doing with the OER? How are you using it in your classroom? And that's by November second. By November thirtieth, evaluate the results. Give us just a quick evaluation. How did it go? If you go through all those steps and you post all, because part of this is talking to other people, right? When you finish, we will give you a badge as a collaborator, a choral collaborator, okay? Now this constitutes quite a bit of, of work, actually. Uh, find, going, making an assessment, finding a, a, uh, an OER, implementing it and evaluating it and all the time talking amongst yourselves. That requires a lot of hours. And we will give you CPE credits. We will give you through TEA, through to Texas Educational Agency. We will give you credits. But in addition, we will give you this thing called a badge, okay, which will be uploaded in your backpack. You can click on it, and you'll see the agency. And you'll, you'll see evidence of all the steps you've gone through. OK, so that's you've accumulated now a couple of badges. The last badge here is this is the end of the semester 
we think of semesters, right, at the university level, the end of then the, the, the fall. And uh, now you have a story to tell. And you know we're leading with this. So here you can go to Voices for Openness. If you click on that link, Voices for Openness in Language Learning, aha, it takes you back to, we're very sneaky, we have an agenda. Uh, it takes you back to this website. And here we just want you to go add your voice. Okay, now you talk to people, uh, you talk to people about your experience of using an OER in the classroom. How did it go? And um, as I said, you don't have to have a tremendous amount of expertise for other people who will be identifying with you wherever you are in this big college that we keep talking about. And, we, and very importantly, we want you to send us a picture of yourself. Okay? But that's not until later on. You don't, if, you can, if, if you have a story that you want to tell us right now and you're ready to go, go ahead. All right? But we want you to to uh, actually try to earn all these badges. The first, the first two badges are, are in a sequence, the attendee and the collaborator badge. Okay, so that's the big picture. Um, people keep telling us that they need a little bit more assistance than just the vision. This all sounds great. How do you do this? After you go through these steps, um, I think you're gonna start to find, we're gonna help you find communities to kind of continue this professional development because there really this, there is an infrastructure out there, and we'll help uh, build this this community. Okay, um, let's go back to the yes. Question. Questions. Um, yeah, I have a question as a current grad student. Um, what is going to happen to this data? Is this something that Coral or perhaps other uh, disciplines could study. So maybe looking at the qualitative data that you're collecting, I'm wondering what's going to happen to that. Yeah, okay, that's a question. That I have a question uh, from the audience from a graduate student who says, this is a really interesting pilot study. We didn't say pilot study, but I'm thinking pilot study. Yes, exactly. We're think this is, badges is a, is a brand new concept. It's the infrastructure is still in beta testing, but it's really going to hit pretty soon. Um, and as one of our slides, it gives you, uh, it's now hitting the educational press, so the Chronicle for Higher Education ran an article, Ed Week ran an article, the New York Times ran an article, so it's, it's about ready to hit. Um, and it is much more developed in other communities than it certainly is in foreign languages. In foreign languages, it hasn't hit at all. Uh, and so that's part of Coral's job, is to promote OERs and open education, so that's our, uh, that's, we're going to try to take the lead on that. Um, but you're absolutely right in that this is, this, this could make a great qualitative study for trying to form, so we're starting here, we're starting here and now, the, the foreign language open community, and this is one. I just wanted to mention too that uh, there's actually uh, the, the Haystack and uh, the, the groups that put together the grants for the Badges for Learning, their latest grant uh, proposal, uh, call for proposals is now open and it's to do with research. So basically they're looking for researchers who want to study badges. So that that's going on right now if you're a researcher and you have an idea. What is the name of it? It's, um, it's this, this um, digital, this is the link dmlcompetition.net. And you'll see if you go to that site, the first thing they have is the, the details on their research competition. Um, they've had several different competitions for you know, batch systems and then the batch system infrastructure, and now they're focusing on research. Yeah, um, the, the Haystack is out of Duke University. It's a collaboration of many different universities. So they already have, they already have online um, projects that have been going on for a couple of years, and so they're trying to badgeify the projects. And yeah, they're asking people to come up with research ideas, so they will give you money to, to conduct research on this. Any other questions? So we'll have a Q&A about this. What, what are your react? Oh yeah, actually, yeah, excuse me. We have a, we have even more. Even more goodies. So here at Coral, we're trying to badgeify some of our products. Um, 
one, we start, when we started reading about badges and thinking about it, we realized that we already have a foreign language teaching methods course that's all, that's all online. And we've been receiving emails from people all over the world saying, you know, this is a great course. I wish I could get credit for it. And the light bulb went out off and we said, of course, we would love to give you credit. And now we have a system to award some kind of credit. Not only can we give you these uh, ongoing uh, uh, CPEs, these things that the, the Texas Education Agency gives, but we also will give a badge. And the great thing about our uh, this, this method site is it, it's kind of constructed in terms of a teaching portfolio. Most teachers are, are um, familiar with the notion of a, a portfolio assessment. So at the end, uh, they go through a pedagogical sequence, they go through lessons, they take quizzes, but at the end we say, show us, apply these principles to something. Come up, create a lesson plan or create an activity and tell us at the end how you have implemented these criteria or these ideas. So there's a, some, a concrete exemplar that, that shows how, what you have learned. Uh, so we're taking that idea and if you go through this, you create the material, you upload it, and we vet it, and we say, mm -hmm, this meets this meets our criteria, we'll give you a badge, okay? So um, these are, and not only that, but you have other people who've done the same who are showing you how to do it because this is an actual course. Graduate students here at UT took it. And so you can look at their examples and then you, you take it in your own direction. So um, if you go back, uh, Rachel, to the, the, the home page for this site, you'll see that we have modules in all kinds of areas. So in, in speaking, reading, writing with the basic skills and languages, uh, pragmatics, technology, assessment, all those areas. You don't have to go in any particular order. But it's it's, it's nonlinear. So if you think, well, you know, I'm, I have, I'm pretty good with classroom management. I, I don't need any help in that. But I'd like, I don't know what pragmatics is. What is that? I want to find that out. So you can, you can jump around, you can make this fit according to your needs. So that's one area that we're trying to badgeify. And we'll be giving a talk at Actful about uh, our assessment badge. We're giving a badge for assessment. We hope to have that up and running. Um, the next, we, that would be the badge that you would be getting, let's say, for, for assessment. See, cute little icon. And now we have another site that we are in the process of badgifying. Uh, the uh, Spanish Corpus Proficiency Level Training, who has a mouthful, SPT. And the idea is to uh, help people understand the, the concept of uh, proficiency and the different ways that we uh, talk about proficiency in terms of grammatical accuracy, in terms of uh, vocabulary use, in terms of interactional pattern or conversation management as it's termed here. Um, they, this is essentially a corpus of about 40 different speakers, I believe, according, arrayed then according to proficiency levels. So absolute novice all the way up to, um, I think it, it, it ends with uh, superior, or at, at least what they're terming, um, I guess heritage speakers. So uh, all of this is in Spanish though, right? So this is really focused on Spanish teachers. And it was developed here at UT by Gil Koike and um, it, you can choose, you can see the learners here, you can choose a learner and then each of them are, are answering topics. And uh, you go through and you compare the learners and you rate them and you try to place them where they are uh, on the proficiency continuum. So we're getting badges for people who are using this site to actually show their growing understanding, their knowledge of the construct of proficiency. This does not mean that you can conduct an O, you are not an OPI credential, you know, uh, this oral proficiency interview. Uh, in order to be credentialed, you have to go through actual, that costs a lot of money. We are not set up to do that. But you will really understand um, proficiency. By the way, since I have this up here, um, this is, you can also use this with your students so they understand how language develops because it's really about developmental sequences. Okay, um, so those are the, the, the several things that we're working on, the, the, the badge areas. 
uh, with this proficiency site, this teaching method site, and then the whole general notion of how do you become an open educator in foreign languages. We want to get badges for that. Okay, so I'm interested in any other questions. Devin raised a good point about you, the research possibilities. Any other? Are you all going to do this with us? Yes. I plan on doing it with you, but I have a pragmatic question. How, as a K, as a K-12 educator? Can, can I ask you actually? Because could you come, come, be, be the first person to come and use the microphone? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to break the ice here. I so I, I, okay. I'm getting a little tired. Take it out. <laughs> <laughs> Even then, from the start. Right. <laughs> Well, what they are saying is. Yeah, as a K-12 educator who is very interested in doing this, how would the badges translate to it to a TEA recognized credit? I mean, it may, it may have been the piece that I that I didn't hear. Yeah, th this is something that we're working out right now. I mean, we recently contacted TEA and talked with them about how to award credits for online work, um, and they kind of. Uh, Told us it was up to us to define, you know, how we how we define that, and but we do have the ability to do that. So what we need to do is translate it into the number of hours we think it would take to complete that task. And so, you know, hopefully, eventually they'll recognize the badges and accept the badges. But for now, um, anytime we offer a badge, we also want to have an alternative for somebody if they want to request the certificate. We could send them the certificate. We just we're still trying to figure out the hours issue and like how many hours would translate to each of our badges. Because I was thinking from my from my experience, it's always easier to work with the regional service centers like yeah. Region 13 in the Austin area, and they're a whole lot more amenable to change than to. Yeah, get. that's a really good. We we have met with them some, and I we haven't talked to them about this new idea right. though. So I think that's a great. That's great advice. I think you should do that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I want to follow that up, that that point up too. Um, so we, we have gotten permission from TEA. They have given us. Uh, we are we have been deputized or officialized or whatever. Um, when they told us what was up to, it's, we don't know that much about this new world called open education or informal learning. So it's up to you to tell us how many hours. We got. Oh, that's great. Wow. Um, and the point being that, okay, if you have six, you, you're required to have 60 hours for the year, this is going to be a big chunk of this because this is much more in-depth than going to, a, let's say, an in-service workshop. Um, we're, we're trying to, to, actually what we could do is turn around and say, how much time is it taking? We have an idea in our mind how much time it may take you to do your own curriculum assessment, but people may decide to really do a very complete one. Um, so all of this is kind of, your, this is a pilot study, so we're seeing how many hours this will be for, for people to, to judge in the future. Yeah. The other thing we have to think about is once we put these things on the web, uh, yes, we're here in Austin, Texas, but there are people who contact us all over the world for this teaching method site. In fact, we have another, uh, we, just a couple weeks ago, we received uh, an email from uh, education professor in Denmark, and she said, I really like this, t this, this site, but I'd like to take it apart, and I want to use it to, in my own uh, courses in, in education, she's in the School of Education at her university in Denmark, and she's got all kinds of ideas. So we have to think about education locally, but also uh, uh, badges for education locally, but also kind of globally. So, um, uh, I, yeah, we have another question, but, but I also want to say to the people online, uh, we're, we're taking your queries too, so if you want to, we have a moderator watching and participating, so we haven't heard from you today. <laughs> actually, what somebody was, um, when Juan was actually asking about um, the quality of the material that they have to submit for the badge. Okay, so uh, Wen Hua um, is raising a really good question. Well, what if the quality is not particularly good? Do you still get a badge? No, you don't. Um, you still have to meet the criteria for the... Uh, Rachel was using the issuer, the word issuer. We Coral will issue the badge. So if, they, if you do not meet our criteria for a badge, then we will not give it to you. So there, there are still standards. 
And um, so, yeah, we will have rubrics for, for badges. You, you have to know you have to know kind of what level of proficiency or what, what level of mastery we're, we're expecting you to reach. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we should have some kind of, of guidelines or rubrics for that. Posted for both the learner and the exactly, evaluator. and they'll be posted for both learners and evaluators. So everybody should know. There shouldn't be any kind of ambiguity or guessing. Now we've kept the bar fairly low. <laughs> For everybody should be able to take part in this initial badge, the, the sequence that we just introduced to you, um, the open badges for open educators in foreign languages. And we did that purposely. We think that everybody, really what we're trying to do is promote collaboration here amongst ourselves. So, but there will be, uh, badges can range from something very, very simple to something very complicated and complex that you need to spend a lot of time in, but that's a good, that's a very good point. They have all badges should have identified criteria, um, and the, it, there will be some kind of vetting or evaluation. Um, I'm still trying to figure out how to work this, so you might need help me out here. Very good at doing that. Um, I guess what I wanted to know is that I think coming from like a gaming background, I can see where this comes from. Is that there seems to be in badges? I mean. Showing off what you've received with a badge is great. We do that in the gaming world. But I think there's also a reward system that needs to be really advertised with these badges in that it's not just I get a badge on my open backpack, but there's some sort of actual thing that I get with it, like access to this online community or um, a recommendation from somebody or you know something tactile. I mean, heck, I, I can even see for-profit businesses offering money to do these things because I see how it, 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 it works for you all to get people to engage and do these things, but I guess I was wondering if you could just explain a little bit more of how it benefits the end user more so than just having a badge to show off. And then also to tack on to that is are the, as, at Coral, do you have any concern about managing like the quality of these? Because I kind of perceive this as be, being like that half world, like there's a badge for everything, and so really that means only like a hundred of them are any good. You know? Not to be a hater, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, okay. That's what the central. Uh, I would say one of the issues is quality control. Right. Um, and when Rachel says that anybody can issue a badge. That means true. This infrastructure, an individual, I can give you a badge because I like you, and let's say, you know, it, it, it can it can be silly, um, but the the quality of the badge will depend on the agency. So there's going to be a difference between saying, I learned about cheeses on Fred's cheese page, and now I'm an expert in cheeses, uh, rather than some kind of professional organization that uh, will give you a badge. So there's already built into the system. Uh, who is the issuing the badge, right? Um, I mean, there's a hierarchy in education too, so there's a hierarchy. Uh, some badges will be issued by prestigious organizations, and some aren't, right? So there's there's already that built, built into the system. Um, about the reward system, um, some of these are kind of intrinsically rewarding because uh, you want to gather skills. And what people are telling us is that they they need to be able to show their skills to employers. That's where I was coming from with your resume. That this helps you um, show your skills in a way that's really effective because you can suddenly send all this information to a future employer um, and they simply click on these links and they can verify, okay, there really truly is an organization called CO. I don't know how to pronounce it, coral, curl, whatever, but it exists. It's at the University of Texas and so forth. And they can even access then like the, the, the criteria. So it's very specific, and that's where I was coming from, this underspecified college degree. Right, going back to like what you originally said, like they want to know what you don't know. They really want to know what you can do. What you can do. So if you're a principal and you're hiring a teacher, great, you can speak this language and so forth, but what can you do as a teacher? Um, what particular skill sets that do you have can, that you can use in the teaching uh, of this language that maybe somebody else doesn't have? So it does, it raises the bar in a way. Thanks. So a question.
question about issuing badges and working with the Mozilla people. Do they evaluate the way you create the tasks associated with the badge, or they don't care what you do to issue a badge? Yeah, th this is open, and, and the question too about the proliferation of badges, and, and you know, this is just like when we were talking about OERs yesterday, these are open badges, so they're really just providing the infrastructure for sharing. Um, there, there's no restrictions on what you actually do with that. Um, now, for something like P2PU, um, like if you're in a community, the community develops standards for the badges, so your badge has to be actually accepted by the community before P2PU will let you publish their, that badge in their platform. So it really is kind of up to the issuer to develop their own criteria for what is a good badge and a bad badge, or you know, what, what meets their criteria and they will create a badge for it. Is that yeah. Quick question from the, uh, online. Um, can people try one task multiple times? Or can you? Uh, yeah, theoretically you can try the task, keep going at it. Um, so if you, uh, let's say, some for our teaching methods site, for example, um, and one of the tasks is to create uh, an oral assessment, right? We, we have one of those activities following particular guidelines. And they send us a three-page document. It's, it looks like a test, but it doesn't meet three of the seven criteria, it will be rejected and you should get feedback and then you have to do it again. And so, so certainly built into that is this idea that you can take a, a task to meet the challenge, mm -hmm. right? Okay, and the next one's not really a question, but there's a lot of discussion online about systematizing um, of badges and creating hierarchy of badges, which you already talked about. Right. And I guess I just wanted to comment on that. I think what you're working towards people understanding is just like the, in the creation of an OER, participation and involvement of the public is going to bring import and um, validation to these badges. I don't know if you want to talk more about that. Yeah, I think some badges will, will try out and we'll see that they're, they're a failure. Mm -hmm. um, either people don't, we, we think there's a perceived need, but there really isn't, so that, that, that might be an issue. I mean, we won't, we won't those, those, those badges will go away. The idea of systematizing it, there is no system yet, so it's kind of a self-organizing system. Once it gets going, you get feedback from the community. Some badges will be, uh, I think, um, will be very popular and some won't. Um, some badges may be a little bit too complicated. I mean, but we'll, we'll figure this out, but this is, that's exactly right. It's, it's, we, we'll get feedback from the people who want the badges. I just want to comment on that too with badge systems. Um, I, for one, was completely overwhelmed when I started reading about badge systems um, because, you know, if you're really planning it out and you're you want to have different levels and different, you know, how how big of a chunk like what are, how how big of a chunk do you use for a badge and how many badges and roles and I mean, there's just so it, it's just a big open question, um, how do you create these systems? And um, now that people have really started thinking this through, uh, primarily because of that competition that's going on, that DML competition, you can actually read um, uh, organizations who are implementing this are starting to post back like what their experience has been like in trying to develop these systems and um, what their process has been like. And I think our process right now <laughs> is just start with something small and just try it out and see how it goes. I think um, you know other organizations are really um, planning it all out and, and um, developing very you know complex systems. So uh, it's, yeah, we don't really have any good models right now. There's no models out there, so that's what we're all trying to figure out. Um, I do want to say too. I keep saying that this is not this is a new idea, but a lot of people are really excited about it. Universities are trying to implement this. Actful is having a discussion about this. So I was talking at, at one of our voices for openness is the new president of Actful, Tony Tyson, and so she sees a lot of potential in this. Um, 
actively would hope to take a leadership role in this, but um, it, can, it doesn't have to be from just the top down. This is kind of a grassroots movement, so it's going to come from all directions. Uh, any of you can be empowered to, uh, by the way, then at this point, uh, it's important to make, any of you can uh, issue a badge. Um, for example, Accesso um, can issue badges. If you want, and, and Amy was telling me um, after our panel discussion that she would like to ask the public to send in, the, the Spanish teachers to send in ideas. So if you think of, uh, of Accesso as kind of a template, there are different kinds of topics, there are different kinds of activities. So she said she would like to kind of issue this call for submissions to her she would vet the quality of it, or she'd be in contact mm -hmm. with you, and then eventually, perhaps, they would post it. It would become part of Accesso. Well, you could badgeify that process and give them some kind of a reward. Not only do they get credit for contributing to your, whatever it is, your corpus, or your, in this case, pedagogical materials, um, but you also get this thing called a badge, which formalizes it and, and uses this Mozilla infrastructure and so forth. I'm just saying, this is just an idea. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll use the microphone now. Um, I was thinking the whole time, actually, who is going to be evaluating the work just locally for the coral badges? Because I'm thinking it's a global thing, and there's going to be more and more input, and I'm wondering if it's going to be grad students of foreign language education, is it going to be the community, and who's going to be evaluating? And what if there are Good thousands question. every day? Yeah, 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 because we thought um, what, this is opening the floodgates. Right. And, and if we put something, um, if we badgeify, if we, if we have badges for language professionals, foreign language professionals, and we have millions of users, oh no. Mm -hmm. Yes, we thought about that. Um, so some of the badges, uh, it's not like giving feedback on an essay, let's say, which is very time intensive. We should then develop kinds of challenges that we can quickly see whether the people meet that, that challenge, where they have a kind of mastery of things. So we're trying to figure out ways, smart ways, clever ways, where we can evaluate things quickly that don't, that, in other words, if we have a small team, we cannot evaluate thousands of entries. So we're, we're thinking about that. The other thing is then to crowdsource this, right? So again, try to ask a lot of our colleagues around the country to join us in this effort. Um, identify people who have various expertise. So if it's a badge that deals with the Spanish language, we certainly want Spanish experts, Spanish speakers helping us. If it's about a technical issue, because there are badges for people who want to learn more about the technical aspects of OER, we need a technical a staff person to, to develop that. So yeah, we've, we've been thinking about putting together teams of people, it's always collaborative, teams of people who can help with the evaluation process. But part of that's also designing the actual challenge itself to not make it too cumbersome and too time consuming. Okay, well, these are questions. I, I mean, what do you? I, I'm, I'm interested in your comments or your reactions to this. Because this is new, right? Is this? What do you think about this, Jared? I like this concept of badges, but I'm a little concerned that the badge I give, or the badge for I don't know Spanish one vocabulary on this versus that person's Spanish one vocabulary. So the two different badges could exist out there, and Where's the validity? Where's the where's the weight? So the question, uh, or the comment rather, is or the worry is about this proliferation of badges. You can give the same badge. The example um, was uh, if I give a, a badge for the acquisition of vocabulary in my Spanish class, and somebody else give it looks like a similar badge but has very different criteria. You're right, that, that is probably going to happen. I wouldn't say it's a possibility, because if you have an open system, there's going to be redundancy, and there's, there's going to be messiness. And this is where people um, who really study open systems will say, oh, well, this is ecology. Ecology is messy, and evolution is messy. And um, that's truly what they say. Um, so I think, I think you're right. I think that's going to be part of the system. 
but it's a self-organizing system. So people want a badge that is issued by an organization that has some kind of power behind it or some prestige because that badge will likely be more important to them in the long run than the other, ba other badges. So uh, I would say too that the criteria is embedded in the badge. So somebody comparing the two badges can say, oh, the criteria is right there. So, you know. so right, so superficially it could have the same exact same title but again, you can click because the infrastructure allows you to click on it and get all the metadata. And they, will, they, they should be e, e, it should be easy to compare. That's my, was my starting point. If you're looking at a resume, two resumes can use the same wording, but if you start to drill down and verify, oh, they don't mean the same thing at all. Will you be able to, to determine who issues, who else issues badges? Like criteria, you, you want to use badges for your students, but I don't want to issue them. I want, I want Carnegie Mellon. To yeah, yeah, that's uh, coming. Um, currently, there's no good place to go and find what badges are out there. I know that's something Mozilla is planning. Um, that's coming, and, and also I should say that the display function, you know, that's still in development too. I mean, we're starting issuing badges here, but they go into your backpack and who's going to see them? Well, probably nobody right now, <laughs> but that's changing. It's changing very fast and, um, you know, it really is about uh, these communities and Coral eventually will have a place. I, I, we haven't, you know, quite figured out how it's going to look, but, you know, we want if, if um, we have our methods course and we have, um, people contributing content to the methods course and earning badges. That's a community feature to the methods course and those badges would be part of that community infrastructure. Um, so it, it's all coming, but it's, there, it's not all here yet. And we will, if you, if you, if you earn your badge now, then, then we'll say that, we'll always know that. And so then if we do end up creating community and we can, we can show it later. Go away. Um, just, I guess as a wet blanket logistical question, how do you know the person applying for the badge is the person in actuality? Like, couldn't I just apply for a badge and give everyone here my badges? Like, I'd earn them all, but under different names and just basically redistribute them under those fictitious names or real names. They, there, there are some, I don't know, you can go to the Mozilla site and read, there's lots of discussions about that, that aspect, that security, you know, verification, validity, you know. Um, I don't know exactly how easy it is to game the system. I, I mean, I think they're still trying to figure that out to try to make it, make systems less. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, the, the one thing is that there's always evidence. I mean, a badge is embedded with that learner's name and the particular evidence provided by that learner. So, I don't know. I'm sure there's a lot of scenarios where you could gain the system, but there, there, there are, they, they are, they have to do, they, they do relate back to the host. The issuer has to have something that Mozilla can verify with on the, the host website. So, I don't know if that makes sense. But. But, yeah, but. But the only, since it's just an email address at this point, it, it could be potentially very easy to game the system. And what I would say is, again, in open, open systems, people will always find ways to game the system. Okay? And that's part of the messiness that you, I mean, it's, it's like good and the bad of the internet. We're talking about cognitive surplus, like the yesterday. Well, cognitive surplus can, is t neutral as a term. It, it's not always it, it good. Right? Cognitive surplus can be terrorism. People have time on their hands, they build bombs. They don't always build educational products. So the comment, the comment is, well, um, you could improve uh, the security by having um, 
a, a, an email address that comes from an institution such as .edu, so University of Texas .edu or Baylor .edu and so forth. Right, and that, that would be more secure than just saying a, a Gmail or Yahoo or something like that. But then what do you mean? Yeah. yeah, I would say to that, um, I don't, I, I use my Gmail account now. <laughs> more, more and more people use Gmail account. I mean, I, I actually have a U Texas account, but you know, I just use Gmail. So those are the trade-offs, right? Uh, addressing. <laughs> Addressing the issue of, of uh, reliability and all that sort of thing. I, I, I think uh, when Daniel was talking about rewards from the community and so forth, something, I mean, this comes from gaming, right? So, and, and OER and gaming communities have things in common. In other words, it's a voluntary, interrelational thing which really doesn't necessarily translate into professional domains that easily. So we, I, we probably shouldn't get hung up on whether employers are going to look at your badges when they're in a hiring process yet. That might be possible way down the line, but at the moment it's more of a gaming model where it's an in, in, let's see, intra-communal uh, authentication of activity, which is really worth nothing more than that. Right. And that's not bad. That, yeah. I agree. It's intrinsic because you're showing you're a member of a community. Yeah. And you're right that the communities, these are native to particular communities and to say that your potential, uh, the principal is going to act like a gamer. You're right. You're absolutely right. Call me out. Um, so that's, on the other hand, this really grew out of not only gaming, but also, as I was saying, design, web developers who needed a way to show, in their case, employers, that their skills are, are changing very quickly. And the professional development in their sense was, well, the, the, the college degree wasn't quite cutting it because after two years, what does that mean anyhow? So they're used to actually, in their CVs, of putting down, um, uh, displaying their skill sets a little bit differently. They do have URLs where they can already, and the employers go and, and take a look at what they've done. When I was looking to hire Rachel, for example, she gave me a very complete, uh, she gave me those things like badges and I could go and verify them. So, but you're absolutely right. It's not analogous in, say, foreign language professional development. So what our focus is really on is community building and getting people um, working with, with, with web developers has been really interesting for me because when they have a question, they turn to the community. Um, and they're constantly posting and finding out things from, from, so software developers speak to software developers online all the time. I thought, shoot, that's really great. Um, maybe we can do something like that, but we need to build that community. We need to kind of have the social practice of posting and, uh, in, in, in these blogs or whatever. Okay, well, we're coming up on noon. Um, I want to thank all of the participants here um, and also the participants online. This has been a really great discussion. I hope that you have enjoyed it, and I hope also that you hope that you've gotten something from it. And uh, I also really hope that you participate in our badges because that's where things are going. And you're absolutely right, Devin was right, this is a pilot study. Um, I mean, we're not just doing this for research, we're doing this because we think that it, it is going to start right here with us. So please have a stab, take a stab at this. Um, we've, we've really thought heavily about how we can add, lower the bar to make these doable, but at the same time um, make them uh, relevant to getting you guys involved in, in the whole production of OERs and open education. And we don't know where this is going, but we think it's going someplace exciting. So. Thank you very much.